Tonight we talk about how our instincts are often wrong. And the result of that is we push for government policies that often make problems worse. Of course, a politician who pushes stupid but popular policies gets rewarded for that. He'll probably get reelected and push more stupid policies. But in business, someone whose instincts lead him to do stupid things gets punished. The free market punishes him. In business, you face reality or you go out of business. And that has some surprising unintended consequences. Good ones, says historian Jonathan Bean. He's a fellow at the Independent Institute and author of Race and Liberty in America. Jonathan, in your book, race is the largest word in the title. Why? What does that have to do with free markets? People will ask me, everybody's a racist, business people are racist, business people are greedy. How can you argue that business people uh, had something to do with the civil rights movement. And I, and I argue in my book they had a lot to do with the civil rights movement. What? Well, let me give you one example. Branch Rickey uh, built a business empire with the St. Louis Cardinals. He was a gruff, anti-New Deal Republican. He was a fierce businessman. He built a, a championship series. He had the St. Louis Browns. He had a Negro League team. This is baseball we're talking about. Baseball? Baseball! He builds it up into an empire. The business is doing well, but he could not let black consumers into the business, so he went to Brooklyn and hired It was hired against Jack the law. To it was against the law. literally was against the law to admit blacks to baseball. And he had Jackie Robinson over in Kansas City. Uh, he saw all this talent out there. Other people wouldn't hire it. Those other people were punishing themselves for their racist uh, acts. And so he left for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and they ended up winning championships in the St. Louis Cardinals nosedive. St. Louis Cardinals did not hire a single black player until 1958. And they lost all those championships. And people started to hire black players because it was good for business. It was good for business. And the perception is that business is racist and evil. Government has to protect us from that. But at the time, it was government that was racist, enforcing Jim Crow. And even southern businesses fought that? I hadn't heard about that. Yeah, uh, you know, government was Branch Rickey's problem. He had to escape the government of Missouri to go to New York City with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, down south, there were companies like Pepsi who advertised to black consumers. Uh, well, we have some, some pictures of that, if we could put that up. And they were doing it when it was illegal, according to the government, yeah. to, to share Pepsi at the lunch counter. Uh, these ads came out before people knew who Martin Luther King was. Uh, because Pe Pepsi wanted to make money. Well, Pepsi was nearly bankrupt during the Great Depression. Uh, a man with a vision, Walter Mack, said, Coke won't sell to Negro consumers, so we'll sell to Negro consumers, and uh, uh, the rest is history. In Jacksonville, Florida, city officials acting at the behest of companies wouldn't force segregation ordinances. No. Everybody knows about Plessy versus Ferguson that says separate and equal is okay on these streetway and buses, cars. But uh, what happened was they, they didn't want to enforce it. It cost them business. And so they fought it. Blacks boycotted. It was a mess. And so ultimately, the government had to, in many cities, had to force uh, the businesses to do it. In one city, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, the companies convinced the government to back off. And other places, businesses refused to obey the Jim Crow law. They said, we want to serve every customer. Yeah, we assume that when government passes a law, that business is going to follow through. And uh, the corporate lawyers for these companies just dragged their feet. And uh, that was to the benefit of minorities. But it was also to the benefit of business. And years before, uh, more than 100 years ago, there was something called the Chinese Exclusion Act. Yeah, the Chinese Exclusion Act all up and down the West Coast, businesses hired Chinese workers. And white workers wanted to keep the Chinese out so that they could get their wages up. These are labor unions. Business stepped in, went to Washington, D.C., and testified that keep the Chinese are the best workers that we have in America. And uh, they ultimately lost that case. But business against labor, against big government, that's going to be the story of immigration right up to this present day. Business saying, let's be inclusive, let's let people in, and unions and government saying, no. 
Well, they want to hire people on the merits. I mean, look at uh, Google. Business wants to hire people. Business wants to hire people on the merits because, uh, um, you know, many companies have been founded by immigrants. Uh, look, the person who doesn't hire the best employee because that employee is, is Chinese or Japanese or black is giving that employee to his competitor. One more benefit of capitalism, which we instinctively hate. So thank you, Jonathan Bean. Stick around. The audience wants to question you and some of our other guests. Yeah. We're back now with audience comments and questions for Michael Shermer from the Skeptics Society. Brian Kaplan, an economist from George Mason University. Uh, David Ropiak, author of the book, How Risky Is It Really? And Jonathan Bean, author of Race and Liberty in America. So who's first? Yes, sir. If you ask most of those people that we, you interviewed on the, the street, they would probably agree that government is, pro, uh, for the most part, inept and corrupt. The same token, too, those same people, I would think, would want more government intervention to have a, uh, an, uh, uh, an equal playing field for people, in, uh, for the people in this country in general. Why do you think that those two issues, the ineptness and corruptness, don't coincide with their desire for less government. Anyone? I mean, I totally agree with him in that people say government's corrupt. We need government to fix that. Uh, I think instinctively, yes. Uh, but if, if, as long as it's our tribe that we're connected to, then we feel like, well, they'll make the right decisions if they're the kinds of decisions we want them to make. And then if, it, if, the, if it's going in favor of the other tribe, the other group that we don't like, then we'll, we'll then attack them as being incompetent and corrupt and so on. We only see government people as corrupt when it's the other party or the other guy. And let me, if, if I may add, Sean, there's a very interesting example of exactly this in Texas. So Texas is seen as a conservative, libertarian, government, leave me alone sort of a place. There are lots of variations. They have uh, recently adopted something for drunk driving called no refusal. So in many states, when you're stopped for drunk driving, attorneys tell you don't blow, right? Don't give them the breathalyzer because the sanctions are worse. Um, if in Texas you're stopped when they're enforcing this law called no refusal and you refuse to blow, the state of Texas now has the right to take your blood. Talk about government intervention. So you would think that Texans, libertarian, conservative government... Would object to that. Except for, as Michael alluded to, they're more afraid of drunk drivers than they want government to butt out and there wasn't a peep. I, I mean, I th that's, a great, <laughs> that's a great question. I think the problem is, and this is why I wrote my book, if you open a high school history textbook, that's the only exposure most people are going to have to American history. And there's this progressive script. The government comes in and saves us from the evil racist things that happen. But, I mean, look, it's segregation, it was government. Forced sterilization of the inferior races. The Nazis got that from us. I mean, I'm not making that up. So, but it's no surprise that government schools are teaching uh, that government is good. And uh, so uh, it's good that a lot of people are opting out of government schools today with homeschooling and private schooling. It's good when it works for you. I mean, also, I think that to most people, corruption and ineptness means government not doing stuff. So there's not really any contradiction in their minds because they think that a, a government that was honest and was doing and uh, honest would actually be doing a lot. And their complaint is it's not doing what they think it should. Yes, sir. What can the schools do or what maybe can we do to try to educate people to get past their instincts and to actually step back and try to think of things rationally and logically? This is such a brilliant question for all of us, I think. Um, I think we need to get past the belief that perfect reason is even possible given the human animal that we are. The brain is really only the organ with which we think we think. There are vast bodies of evidence that we all know about that suggest these are deeply, deeply ingrained, connected to survival sorts of instincts. What we can do, I think, my argument is, we can realize that our instincts get us into trouble. And we can be rational enough to study where those instincts come from, as Michael has written about, as many of us have, and use that knowledge of our foibles to be smarter about the foibles being dangerous for us. I sometimes use the analogy that that knowledge of the danger of risk decision making being a risky environment is like when you go out driving, you put on a seatbelt, you're entering a risky environment, you have a tool. We have the tool of knowing where these foibles come from, and we can rationally make better choices if we learn from what we've learned about our instincts and our emotions. And I think I, a you know, very important thing to do with education is just tell people the answers. 
there's so much effort made to teach everyone all of American history and then say, now figure out what you're <laughs> supposed to learn from it. That isn't how people learn. Uh, you know, when, you, when you give people an enormous amount of information, they, at the end they just say, well, I don't know what to think. It uh, really would be better to, do, to just say things like, look, you know, the uh, free trade works, here's why, and not expect people to connect the dots. You've just got to give a uh, cut to the answers. I'm not that optimistic. I mean, I would love the schools to improve things. I'm old enough to know it's not going to happen in my lifetime. So we've got to go around the schools. May I offer one other suggestion to you? Sometimes government has to step in on our behalf when what, what feels right does us and other people harm. We have laws against drunk driving and whatnot. That but not right. often. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, world. I wanted to get that in in Foxland. <laughs> Yes. The differences between the way men and women look at things, men kind of want to be rough and play hard, women want to be compassionate and, and nurturing. Is, is any of this uh, based upon like a male or female dominated society or, or are we feminizing things where we can't Are instincts from men and women different? In risk perception they are dramatically. There's in fact there's something called the white male effect and I emphasize the white as well. If you ask people in any group what are you afraid of? Rank them one to ten. They'll all rank them the same, genders, races, and so forth. But if you ask them how many people they killed, they'll rank them right. If you ask them what are you more afraid of, white men between 18 and 59 are about 10 or 15 percent less afraid of the same stuff. Because, the <laughs> research suggests, white men think they have more control. That's why the white, as well as the male part, a uh, guy walking down the street is less afraid than a woman because of this sense of control, and minorities, the same feeling. So in risk perception, it's absolutely proven. Uh, from my Facebook page, Dan Barber wants to know, is belief in God based on instinct? It is. I think uh, it comes naturally to think that there is some hidden force behind the scenes pulling the strings and running the show. Uh, we call that an agency that, that, that we tend to see, invisible agents running things, spirits, Which gods. is sort of natural from childhood. Mom right. and dad ran the show That's from right. the tribe. The elders might have run the show. That's why I even think there's something like a god of the government. We almost see the government as almost like a deity force that, that we can pray to in the sense of casting our vote and telling them to do things for us. It's on our not a God. Don't believe that. <laughs> in that case, you're a government atheist. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Shermer, Brian Kaplan, David Ropiak, and Jonathan Bean.